Hello again, I'm Tom Morbido, a psychologist with the Mill Creek School District, and as usual, I'm joined by my colleagues Marianne DeSaro, Kim Quirk, and Karen Staub. Today we're going to talk about a topic that I think most of us can relate to it at one time or another, and that's the topic of anxiety. And why don't we get started by asking Kim, Kim, if you can tell us what actually is anxiety? I think if you just think about it, it's um, as a worry. You know, it's really in, uh, an excessive, excessive fear about something. It could be real or it could be something imagined, but just a worry overall. Okay, and is it is it? Uh, Prevalent in, in certain children? Um, definitely more prevalent in females. Um, in two to fifteen percent of all children have some form of anxiety. Um, typically, um, we start to see anxiety in teens to the early thirties, but very strongly it hits the twenties. And there's a very strong genetic component. You know, typically family members who have it. A lot of times their children would have it. But um, just because you have it as a child does not mean you will grow up to be an anxious adult, though. Okay, and, and can you talk a little about a little bit, Kim, about uh, what it might look like at different ages in children and adults? And if you have children, you know that this um, happens. You know, when kids are typically between the ages of seven to nine months old, they have that um, stranger anxiety. They just want to be with mom and dad or somebody that they really know. When they get to that 12 to 18 month range, they really don't want to separate. If you try to drop them off, it could be even at grandma and grandpa's. They don't want to separate from mom and dad, so it kind of changes a little bit and then usually that ends typically around the age of two and then when you get to school you get more specific anxieties it could be about friends it could be about tests but it becomes much more focused and then in adolescence it becomes much more abstract about religion or morals and those sorts of things that kids start to worry about okay I know that there's a lot of different kinds of anxieties uh, and different diagnosis can you go into that a little bit for us um, as I said there is that separation anxiety that kids can become very clean there's also just that generalized anxiety. Kids can't pinpoint um, a specific thing. They're just worried about everything. There's something called PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. That's um, in relation, something has happened to the child. You know, whether it's something physical, emotional, um, something they've, they've been in a car accident, it's something in their life traumatic has happened that they are now uh, reacting to. You'll start to see uh, maybe flashbacks or they're reliving um, the experience again. Uh, social phobias, we probably see those at school, but just about being in um, social situations. A lot of people have around a large groups of people. And then there's one called obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, another form of anxiety where um, you could either have thoughts that you think about repeatedly over and over, or actually the compulsions where you see people do things repetitive over and over again. Um, the kids and adults, can look very similar, but typically it's a little bit harder to see in kids because they look more irritable or uh, more inattentive, but it really could be anxiety that's impacting them. And I think Karen's going to be talking a little bit more about the differences um, in things. Well, I know that some reactions that we have, like stress or uh, or our reaction to stress or fear, those are, those are healthy kinds of uh, healthy kinds of responses. But can you tell us, um, you know, What's the difference between actual anxiety and some of those more healthier kind of responses like you know, fear, uh, flight, and those sorts of things? Because I do think anxiety is good. There's always a point though when it becomes when you can't function, it's no longer healthy for you. Because anxiety can make us perform better in certain situations, but it gets to a point where you can't perform. So if you're just afraid of something, that's um, it could be you have a fear of an, an animal or um, something specific, that's a fear. Stress, if you're feeling stress, you'll usually see it as you can't concentrate concentrate, you're not sleeping, or you're eating more, or you're eating less, those are more stress. The anxiety I talked about, you know, it's more vague and then that worry again. And then there's that panic, which is the extreme where you become um, dizzy, trembly, um, feel like you're going to faint breathing, you know, it feels more physical I, I think I've gone through all three of those since I dropped my card <laughs> on the floor. So moving right into along, you know, Karen, uh, Kim's given us a nice general overview of anxiety, but can you talk more about the specific characteristics of the disorder? There, there are basically three categories that we look at. There are cognitive characteristics, mm -hmm. you know, how does a person think, what, how, how does their thinking impact them, them? and then the, the, there's also a um, behavioral component, what kind of things do we see them doing, um, I, and, and there's also a physical component, what kind of physical symptoms are they experiencing. 
Um, if you look at the cognitive characteristics, <clears throat> many people just have tremendous concentration difficulties. They just can't focus. Their mind is just filled with other things. Um, oftentimes there's an overreaction to a situation. There's a, a relatively minor event, but there's a reaction that is, is very unpredictable in terms of the, the degree to which the youngster or the person reacts. Um, there can be memory difficulties. Uh, we see this a lot with students, um, in the, particularly at the high school level. We see students who are like, I studied all night, but I just really can't remember what I studied. Um, there's, there's the general worry that Kim talked about, that they're just kind of anxious coming in. When you ask them um, wh what they're fearful of in the school setting or what's going on, um, they really can't tell you what it is. They're just kind of anxious about the whole building, about the whole setting. Um, they oftentimes present as very irritable, very cranky. Um, there's a tendency to um, be a perfectionist, and that often has to do with the, the need to control the situation and manage the situation. So they want everything to be just so, so they don't have those excessive worries. Um, <clears throat> sometimes there's some vi very rigid thinking. They have difficulty um, uh, thinking about how to do something a different way or how to view something a different way. They can also be very hypervigilant. They're just on the alert all the time. They're just there's never a time when they relax. Right, and just, and that's where it makes it difficult to diagnose. Let's see, ADHD and anxiety because they both present in that sort that of way. way. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fear of losing control. There's a fear of failure. Um, there can be difficulties both with problem solving and with their academic performance. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at some of the behavioral symptoms, you see, you see a lot of common things. And, and these are the kinds of things that you have to be really cautious about uh, deciding that it's actual anxiety or it's just a part of their personality. You have to kind of view what they're, what they're demonstrating as, um, is this something they've done over their life? Have they been kind of shy over their whole life? If that's the case, then it's really not anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's just that they tend to be a more reserved, shy person. Um, are they a little bit withdrawn, or are they a lot withdrawn? That, that's, that's another question you're going to ask yourself. Um, they're con are they constantly asking questions? Um, do they constantly have to ask for the teacher for the things that they've already written down and they already know are very obvious? Um, <clears throat> do they need a lot of reassurance from adults or from other peers? Uh, do, they, do, do they need routine? Does it have to be the same way every day? Um, sometimes you'll actually see <clears throat> some uh, pressured speech, some, some excessive speaking, some um, the need to, to constantly uh, fill a space and, and in terms of, of words. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of restlessness. You know, you'll see them tapping and fidgeting and moving. And, and, and all of this is their attempt to, to calm themselves down right. internally or get into right. that state of equilibrium that, that you know, we, we all try to exactly. stay in, right? Exactly. Sometimes you, you see a little bit of impulsiveness. Sometimes you see kids who are a little bit unpredictable um, in terms of, of what they might do. Um, and, and that's where you get into a little bit of, of danger, where you have to really monitor them a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. um, the last area is the physical characteristics that they might have. Um, you might have somebody who kind of trembles or um, has um, rapid breathing. You might have um, somebody who is um, actually kind of cold and clammy. They just kind of are freezing up. Um, you can have shortness of breath. Some kids get dizzy. You know, some kids feel faint. Um, some kids will complain of um, uh, either um, like stomach aches, you know, I, I feel sick to my stomach, um, those kinds of things. A lot of times they'll just have a lot of different physical complaints. Mm -hmm. And these symptoms <clears throat> have to go over a long period of time. In, in other words, if a child has a stomach ache once over a test, mm -hmm. we're not going to diagnose right. them with anxiety right. disorder. So right. it's more of a, it's more of a, uh, a historical kind of information gathering in order to, to actually get the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it relate, anxiety relate to other conditions, Karen? Well, some of the other things that you'll see, um, there's a lot, there are other um, mental health conditions that um, so have anxiety as a part of them. For example, if somebody is depressed, um, there, there will be some anxious uh, features mm -hmm. to that depression. Yeah. Um, and, and that typically, uh, anxiety is typically a part of many uh, depressed presentations. If you look at attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you will see um, that inattention, that, that inability to concentrate as a, as a problem. And in, oftentimes in young children, you, they're, they're often diagnosed very early as ADHD, but it later, as they, as they approach school age, um, it will manifest itself more like an anxiety problem than a true attention deficit problem. Um, 
and, and you'll see that they'll have difficulties with their school performance. Um, you, will, you will see similarities there. Sometimes a youngster who struggles in school um, may become very avoidant and may become um, not want to take a test in reading or not want to go to school to do reading. And it's really that they're having a performance problem, not necessarily an anxiety problem. Um, at the high school level, the last thing that you look at is sometimes the things you see in a youngster who's beginning to have some substance abuse issues will also look very much like anxiety, so you have to sort that out as well. Um, one of the things about high school students is you often see difficulties with sleep. Um, and you see some of their vegetative activities, they're eating, they're sleeping, they're, the things that they should be doing every mm -hmm. day as a human it's being interrupted. gets interrupted. And so those are things that you see in both circumstances, whether it be um, substance abuse or anxiety. I know it affects motor skills because I keep, <laughs> dropping, I keep dropping my cards. Uh, but, but overall, any, any kind of significant change in behavior, though that can be attributed again to other conditions, right. could, also, could also be anxiety. Right. So those are things that, that not only parents, but teachers and, and right. other, other personnel in, in the school need to be aware of. Right. Okay. Okay, Mary Ann, uh, what are some signs or symptoms that parents should be aware of in their children? when it comes to anxiety? Well, I think that parents are probably most concerned when the anxiety affects them to a significant degree and they're, they're wondering what, mm -hmm. what should they do about it. Um, as we, um, Kim and Karen explained before, life is filled with anxiety. There's times even children, you know, it is normal for them to experience anxiety when they're gonna do a big change, a transition school change. Maybe they've moved, the family's moved, those types of thing, things, but, um, you know, if, if that anxiety is more pervasive, it's not just in reaction to that event, mm -hmm. but it, it kind of pervades throughout the child's life, whether it be at home, at school, as Karen mentioned, the academics, the socialization, all of that is affected by it. Um, if you can pinpoint the, you know, as, as a normal reaction to life, like a move or something, all of us would, if we change jobs as adults, you know, that causes some level of anxiety and there is, that's actually healthy. That helps you perform better and maybe be, you know, um, more on top of things. But when it actually causes dysfunction in your performance mm -hmm. and with the children, those would be signs of like the schooling and the, and the friendships. And, and it's almost like the two or more worlds colliding at one time and right. causing, you know, right. causing this. And, and if it doesn't, um, get better you know it, um, as I said there's all of us are wired differently we, we have different levels of anxiety mm -hmm. and we're able to cope with those things and you're get, get back on an even track but if that child remains at that like mm -hmm. rocky or tumultuous state emotionally and socially and academically then you know you, you know that you have something that really does need to be addressed more formally mm -hmm. And what are the types of interventions that, that are generally done, with, with, especially with children? Well, I think in a minute I'll be talking about what parents can do to help cope with the situation. But um, professionally, as far as addressing anxiety, there's a, a couple different things. I mean, you're, I've all heard of relaxation techniques, the taking the deep breath, um, kind of visualizing yourself, getting through. I mean, right, right. Okay. Um, getting through whatever the task is at hand, whether it's a speech or whether it is standing in front of the class or maybe initiating a conversation. Um, there's also things like, um, you know, giving a script, kind of preparing the child ahead of time with whatever event that they they have mm -hmm. to go through. Um, the, as far as professional intervention, a lot of that has to do with with therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy, where you work on some of these techniques and strategies and coping skills to deal with the anxiety and that you help the child to handle the anxiety or stress that they're dealing with and to become more confident in themselves and tolerate this uncomfortable feeling that Karen described, um, that they can tolerate those feelings and not have it become worse. Right, it that, sounds like you want the child to experience that anxiety in a more controlled setting. Exactly. Uh, where they can actually practice the skills that mm -hmm. you're trying to teach them so that when they're when they're actually in the, the real situation, they can draw on that kind of learning. Absolutely, and, they, and as they become more skilled with that, they, they get better at it. And the other intervention, and I'm sure parents have heard of this before, is medication, because it is um, a neurochemical thing going on. Um, your body does respond um, when it's 
stressed, there are hormones that are released in your brain and all of us are wired differently and our, our disposition to things is different. And sometimes you, do, you actually do, it's a medical issue and it's a disorder and that sometimes you do need the help of both, you know, these re relaxation te techniques that I talked about, the coping skills, the therapeutic um, piece as well as medication. Right, sometimes the, the medication will, will allow the therapeutic piece to actually be more effective or to actually be maintained quicker. Excellent, absolutely. So what kind of things can parents do for their, their children? Parents, um, it's important to, to provide some a safe feeling for the child. So I think that being consistent in your home and being um, patient with your child and not expecting per perfection, even though they may expect that of themselves, that you as parents, you know, yes, you want them to do well in school and have friends, that you don't expect them to be perfect. Um, and be realistic with the goals. And to communicate to the child that you don't expect perfection. Um, you want a routine for homework and chores and things like that. That and that we all make mistakes. You might want to even disclose some, do some self disclosure disclosure with the child that you know you've made mistakes you know in your lifetime that we all it happens to everyone it's just really your response to the to um, the mistake that matters um, and a, a, a big component is to validate your child's feelings that they are feeling anxious and that it is a uh, normal reaction to some degree and that it really what we want to do is empower them to cope with this anxiety so that they can you know be happy and, and successful um, you also want to do some practice some of those more informal strategies that I spoke about like relaxation techniques and the visual Im imagery that you mentioned and just helping that child become more confident and discreet de decrease their discomfort their feelings of discomfort um, um, things like that and again you might want to practice if they become say you you know um, they're, they're anxious about um, friendships and in social interactions you might give them a script to say or a couple statements to say to initiate a conversa conversation with peers. Um, but again, I do think that part of that intervention is to have parents be very vigilant of these things and monitor um, the child. And if they feel it, that they may need professional help, that they do seek it. Okay. And, and that was going to be my next question, and anybody can jump in. How, do, how does a parent get started if they feel that they've got a child who is experiencing anxiety to a level that would that is beyond the norm? Huh? How would they, where would they start? I, I think one of the first places they start is with the child's own physician. Um, you know, your family physician or you know, your, your pediatrician is the person who should know your child the best in terms of their medical status and their medical care. So you might want to start there and discuss the issue with them. Okay. Oftentimes, um, physicians have um, resources that they work with so that there would be some coordination of care. Um, so that would be the first place that a family would want to start. Um, they can also talk with their school psychologists and their school counselors and, and, and the people that are in their schools because those individuals have resources that they can direct the parents. Uh, help parents get directed mm -hmm. to. So those would be a couple places that you would start first. And I know that I think all of us, all four of us, provide this as a service to parents or informal screenings. It's just a very informal report that we might give mm -hmm. some surveys to both parents and teachers and um, sometimes even if the child's old enough a self-report and to see whether or not that anxiety is pervasive both in the school setting and at home. Sometimes you, you find that it is happening at home and maybe a separation anxiety issue and it's not as pervasive as what parents may think because sometimes school staff don't see the level of anxiety that parents see. Okay, so what would, what would typically be, and, and I imagine this is more problem specific, but typically what would the, the amount of time that the typical course of treatment would take for I, I think anxiety, anxiety is very anxiety. short term, you know, it's More very treatable, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, we're talking, you know, maybe just a few months for depending on the situation because um, it is very specific and there's very specific strategies that Marianne mentioned that if once a kid learns, you know, that they can um, learn to cope better in the future for um, things. So I do think parents need to know it's very treatable and a lot of parents are um, say, well, I have anxiety or I grew up with anxiety. It doesn't mean your child will. If we give them strategies now, you know, they can um, learn how to cope with that. And our counselors are very um, skilled with this as well. So a lot of times they'll have a friendship group and kind of foster those um, relaxation and coping skills and scripted statements like I mentioned before to help the ease that child into situations where they can become less anxious. Right, and that's what we can do as school personnel 
is be a little proactive and, and, and try those sorts of things, the group counseling and, and talking with the kids, and, and do that early to hopefully then prevent any kind of long-term you know, effect from right. whatever that anxiety causing that situation is. Yeah. I, I think one of the important things to, to keep in mind is that uh, you know, oftentimes the first instinct is to avoid the situation. You know, if, mm -hmm. if a youngster goes to preschool and they don't like it or they're, they're not enjoying it, they come home and they cry or they separate and they cry, mm -hmm. um, the first instinct of any parent really is to say, okay, well, we just right. won't mm -hmm. do this anymore. And that's really probably not the best strategy because unfortunately it, it starts to usually set a pattern of avoidance of the problem. And the earlier you address the problem through the techniques mm -hmm. that Mary Ann started to talk about, the, the more uh, they, they will adopt them themselves and not have a problem later on. So even, even though it would be easy to you know, have your child quit the t-ball team or um, you know, leave the preschool or quit the ballet class or whatever they're doing, um, it, it's still not going to address the problem because there's still going to be something that's going to come mm -hmm. next that they're going to be fearful or anxious about. And the, the, the key to treatment is teaching them to tolerate the anxiety, right. not avoid They'll it. They'll actually yes. go through that situation yes. so that they can feel the success. Right. So the next time they feel a stress, they, they might not have the same kind of reaction. Right. Okay, anything else, ladies, before? That's it. Okay, well, uh, if you have, need further information on this topic, you, you can be, feel free to contact any of us. And when we start with Karen, why don't you let the audience know how to get a hold of you? Uh, you can reach me at McDowell um, High School or the Intermediate School. The number you want to call is 835-5382. And I'm at Vernondale, Ridgefield, Tracy, or Westlake in 835-5806. And I'm at Grandview, Asbury, and Walnut Creek, and the number for me is 836-6109. Right, and if you need to contact me, I'm at Bell Valley, Chestnut Hill, and J.S. Wilson, and my number is 835-5385. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for for you know your participation and uh, we hope to be able to do another presentation in the next few months on a topic of interest but until then this is Tom Morbido and I'll see you later